Good morning, and welcome to an online event brought to you by Parkinson's Community Los Angeles. Today we're going to hear about palliative care and how it can benefit families living with Parkinson's disease. I'm Judy Yaris, and I serve as Vice President on the board for PCLA. For those of you who don't know us, we are a nonprofit that supports families living with Parkinson's, and we do this all through free events like this, support group meetings, and more. Today, Let's Parkinson's program is brought to you by our generous sponsors, Abbott, Boston Scientific, Kiowa Kirin, and Supernus, and by donations from the Parkinson's community. If you appreciate what we do, please make a donation on our website at www.pcla.org. Thank you. And just for a few quick notes before we get started. We are recording today's events for YouTube and you will only be visible in the recording if you are speaking. Please stay muted to keep background noise at a minimum. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and you can submit them through the chat at any time. Now, please join me in welcoming our speaker today. Adriana Gonzalez is a licensed clinical social worker at the Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Center at the University of California, San Diego. She is a graduate of San Diego State University, where she obtained her master's degree in social work. Adriana is committed to working closely with the clinical team to support patients in meeting their, in their treatment goals. She is bilingual and leads a Latino outreach program for Parkinson's disease. Outside of work, Adriana enjoys travel, listening to live music, and spending time with her family. Welcome, Adriana. We're so excited to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, so much. And for all of you who have taken this time today to check in and talk about something that maybe so exciting or fun like palliative care, but so important. Uh, I really appreciate that PCLA uh, is, in, is invested in making sure that people are educated about their different options in terms of their care and ways to improve quality of care and quality of life. And so palliative care and Parkinson's disease, we're really going to talk about how this model and in some situations how this clinic um, uh, services delivered via an outpatient clinic can really be crucial to your PD journey. So as Judy mentioned, I'm a social worker. I work in a Parkinson's disease center, but I also for the last two or three years worked in a neural palliative clinic as a social worker. So I like to see firsthand what palliative care is all about and to support families who are seeking out that type of service. So let's get started. Today, I'm just going to give a brief definition of what palliative care is and really hopefully help all of you understand what the benefits of working with the palliative care team are when you're living with a chronic illness like Parkinson's disease. And so whenever I talk about Parkinson's disease and living with a chronic uh, progressive disorder, I often talk about the care team. Because as most of you know, when you're living with a chronic disease, there's a lot of people that you're interacting with, not just within the medical system, but also that your family's interacting with. And so at the center of our team is the person living with Parkinson's disease, but there's also your care partner, there's family members, if you have hired caregivers that take you to your appointments, you might be seeing a uh, neurologist or a movement disorder specialist, uh, but you're also still likely seeing a primary care provider. Maybe you see a therapist or you have a social worker as part of your clinic. Uh, maybe you see a physical therapist and a speech language pathologist. So this team is just really big, right? And so when we talk about palliative care, that is another member of your care team. So it doesn't take place of your primary care provider. It doesn't take the place of your movement disorder specialist, but it's part of this team of uh, this interprofessional team that is providing care to you. Because as most of you might already be experiencing, living with Parkinson's disease, loving somebody who's living with Parkinson's disease means that you're navigating a lot of challenges. 
that you're sitting with uncertainty. There's so much uncertainty with Parkinson's disease. What's to come? What stage am I in? Why do I have this? What is it going to look like in a year or two years, right? There's very real fear of loss of independence and control. Some people talk about the shame or the isolation they feel um, because of their symptoms and their inability to be in social situations without feeling a lot of anxiety. There's a loss of sense of identity. People that have working because of their Parkinson's. Changes in role, people who used to be the, the head of the household who paid all the bills and who now in their identity shifting out of that. The biggest worry that people come to me with, uh, people with Parkinson's, is I, how is this going to impact my family? Or I don't wanna be a burden on my family. And so that's a very real worry that so many people experience and decisions about care. So thinking about, you know, what is this going to look like five years down the line? What types of medical decisions might I have to make in the future? And so all of these challenges and worries are uh, scenarios that we work through as a palliative care team. And here's some misconceptions that some that my, even I myself had before I started working in the palliative care clinic. One, that it's only for cancer patients. Two, that it only or primarily treats pain, that a palliative care physician is only or primarily treating pain. Three, that it means that the doctor is giving up on me, that my movement disorder specialist or my neurologist thinks there's nothing else that they can do for me, so let me um, shift you to palliative care. Four, that it's only for terminal illness, that it's for people who have a, a prognosis that is very short and that it's the same thing as hospice. And so these misconceptions exist for a reason. Palliative care was born out of the hospice movement. So there are a lot of similarities between the palliative care model and, and that it drew from the hospice care model. Um, but we're gonna talk about ways in which palliative care is different. So we know the misconceptions, right? So then what is it? It is a medical specialty that aims to improve the quality of life of patients and families living with serious illness, such as Parkinson's disease. It's a specialty, meaning that a, a doctor went through their full training as internal medicine doctor or oncologist or a neurologist, and then decided to do a fellowship, an additional two years in palliative care. Um, they use, most palliative care clinics use an interdisciplinary team approach to address physical, emotional, social, and spiritual needs. We recognize that one physician cannot do the work of all of these different team members in one visit. And so the palliative care model requires, in order to be billed as palliative care, it has to include a, a treating physician or nurse practitioner, a nurse case manager, a social worker, and a chaplain. It has to be included. And it's collaborative in nature. So patients are still seen by primary care or other specialists, palliative care physicians are very good at that collaboration of knowing when, well, I don't refill your blood pressure meds, but let me send a message to your primary care provider so that they can take care of that and making sure that we're bridging that uh, gap of communication that sometimes exists. And some things about the palliative care model, sometimes it can be confusing because palliative care is a medical specialty, meaning that there are palliative clinics and palliative care physicians who provide this model of care. But what we're finding in Parkinson's disease is that there's a big national push so that our movement disorder specialists, so that our neurologists are utilizing more of the palliative care model especially if they are in a part of the country where people don't have access to a palliative care physician. So the palliative care model means that the person, it's person-centered, so that the person with the, um, with the neurological disorders at the center of everything that we do, that there is a team approach, and not just that there's all these members of the team, but all these members of the team are collaborating together to better assess the person that's sitting across from us. In the palliative care model, we are supporting with goals of care. We are talking about what types of medical decisions are you being faced with now? What type of medical decisions are you going to be faced with in the future? What questions do you have? 
And how do we as a team provide you support to answer some of those questions? And a big pillar of the palliative care model is that we provide caregiver and family support, is that we recognize that the person is more than their neurological disorder and that there are many people who are impacted by this disease and that they are pillars in uh, being able to maintain the person's quality of life. So we are very intentional about making sure that caregivers and families feel supported, feel heard, feel validated, and get assessed for caregiver for situations like caregiver burnout. Okay, so then, you know, what's the difference between palliative care and hospice? Again, they were born out of the same movement, so they are both interdisciplinary. A huge difference is that for palliative care, for somebody to be seen in a palliative care clinic, their prognosis is any stage of the disease. It can be newly diagnosed or diagnosed two years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago. It doesn't matter what stage of the disease they are in. If they are having to navigate a chronic disease, then they can qualify to be seen by a palliative care team. With hospice, it is very strict that the prognosis needs to be the last six months of life. Now, some people who are on hospice care, we hear about it all the time. Maybe they lived for 18 months under hospice care. Um, but for hospice, the doctor has to um, feel or think or assess that the prognosis, that they wouldn't be surprised if this person passed away in six months because of the level of decline and how symptomatic they are. The goals of care are different in palliative care and in hospice. So in palliative care, people can still be seeking uh, curative or disease-modifying treatment. So you can be seen in palliative care and still be in the process for deep brain stimulation or utilizing the most uh, current medications to manage your off time. In hospice, it's comfort focused. There is a focus more on bereavement services. So with hospice, people do have to um, be ready to let go of certain medications. They do have to have an understanding that they can no longer access uh, rehabilitative uh, therapies like speech, uh, speech therapy or physical therapy or occupational therapy. There are things that you that are decided when somebody transitions to hospice where, okay, I'm not doing any of those rehabilitative therapies anymore. Maybe I'm turning off my DBS stimulator at this point because now the focus is on comfort and on treating my symptoms to give me a good quality end of life. Now, palliative care can be delivered in the home if, that's, if you have access to that, home-based palliative care. Not everybody has access to that. Um, in a nursing facility, in the hospital. So if you have a loved one that's ever been inpatient, um, there is an inpatient palliative care team in the outpatient clinic. That's the type of clinic that I've worked in and via telemedicine. For hospice, it's going to be at home or the nursing facility, assisted living or the hospital setting. So a lot of times when people first come to their palliative care appointment, first, they don't know what it is. They just know that their doctor recommended it. And sometimes they ask, well, Adriana, why, why did my doctor think this, is, this was a good fit for me? Or why did they think that I needed this? And so I, I like to, to, to list some of the common referral reasons. One, psychosocial support. So it's often, uh, I, almost, I call it like a crossroads. There's often this crossroads that people with Parkinson's and their family members uh, get to where the person with Parkinson's care needs are increasing. Uh, maybe at a rate that it never increased so quickly. A lot of people will say, oh, you know, they dropped off the cliff and now we have all these symptoms and I don't know how to manage it. And so the family and the care support, they're feeling a lot of stress. And so in that situation, their movement disorder specialist will refer them to our clinic so that we can talk through that, so that we can offer support, so that we can offer ideas and advice, and so that we can offer resources. Advanced care planning. So a lot of times people, maybe they have an advanced care plan, but maybe it's 15 years old, right? Maybe they, when they created their trust and their will, 
They also threw an advanced care plan in there, but this was before they were diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And so they're referred to us because let's look at it. Let's go through it. Let's take the time to make sense that this still makes sense for you and make changes if needed or keep it the same and upload it into your medical record so that all of us understand what's important to you in terms of your medical care and what you would or wouldn't want in the case of an emergency. To communicate prognosis. Now we know, you know, the everybody always says if you line up 10 people with Parkinson's disease, you have 10 people with Parkinson's disease. Really meaning that Parkinson's impacts everybody very differently. And so communicating prognosis can be really tricky because there's so much uncertainty. There are so many unknowns, but there is a common trajectory of the disease. And there are markers that the physicians can pick up on that are telling us, okay, this person's more kind of in the middle stages or they're having more cognitive impairment. So now we're kind of moving into the more advanced stages. Um, but families and the person with Parkinson's, they often have questions about that. What does that mean? Um, when will we know when hospice is the right uh, move for us? And so when we're communicating prognosis, we're also assessing and clarifying the goals of care, which is the, the other common referral reason. And goals of care are often if uh, the person with Parkinson's is starting to have difficulty with swallowing. And, it's, and family members or care partners are concerned about their level of nutrition. So maybe the movement disorder specialist brings up a G-tube, feeding tube, um, and there's still questions about that. We can, they can often be referred to our clinic to talk through, what are your concerns? You know, what are the questions? Is it indicated in this situation? It's really about giving families and patients the information so that you all can make informed decisions about the next step. And so that's what clarifying goals of care means. It means talking with a person with Parkinson's to find out what's important to you, what does quality of life mean to you, and how can we maintain that and support you as you have to make some of these decisions about your medical care. And so how can palliative care help? A big question that we get in our clinic is exactly this. Well, how can you help us? And so what does that actually look like? So a lot of times when people are referred to us because the caregiver is overwhelmed and they're needing more support in the home and their loved one's care needs are increasing, sometimes they come to our clinic and they say, well, do you have a nurse that can come to the home? Can you guys provide care? And that's not, that is not usually what a outpatient palliative care clinic can provide. But what we can do is do a full assessment and talk about the types of resources that exist in the community and talk through ways that that care can be managed. And so that falls under this umbrella of family and caregiver support. So providing information about support groups if you don't already have it. Talking about the benefits of counseling, referring somebody to see a therapist to kind of work through so many of those emotions or scenarios that they're navigating. We do in the visit talk about strategies for coping or assess, you know, what is your level of coping? How have you been dealing with all of this? And then again, explore available resources for care needs. So even though we can't go into the home to provide care, we can be a sounding board, we can brainstorm with the family to figure out what resources do we have access to and how do we get access to them? We do, part of a palliative care clinic is always spiritual care, that's always included. So whether you see the spiritual care counselor or the chaplain during the visit, or maybe they follow up with you afterwards, it's always gonna be a component of what we do. And what a spiritual care counselor can support people with is engage them with their faith community if that's something that they lost touch with. A lot of people during the pandemic um, were not able to be engaged with their faith community. So the spiritual care counselor kind of bridges that gap for them. For people who express, you know, I don't have a religious practice or I don't belong to a faith community, then the spiritual care counselor can really work with them to explore other types of spiritual practices, whether that's meditation or having a gratitude practice, or if they say, you know, what helps me feel calm and at peace is to be outside in nature, then talking about how can we incorporate that more into your day-to-day -day life. 
with the ultimate goal of supporting people with spiritual distress, recognizing that when you are diagnosed and living with a chronic disease that's progressive, that is going to create some distress and spiritual care counselors are master's level clinicians who can support you and assess you in that area of your life. Again, that's part of that whole holistic view of the patient and supporting their social, emotional, and spiritual selves. Symptom management is a big part of what the clinician does, the physician or the nurse practitioner. Uh, as you, you all know, uh, the non symptoms of Parkinson's disease are very distressing for people with Parkinson's and their family members. And so the palliative care physician is very well versed in treating pain, constipation, sleep, and making sure that you have the referrals to rehab that you need, the home health need, or, or to assess, you know, what other specialists could be helpful in this situation. And again, we do a lot of work around goals of care, and that can mean discussing transitions in care. That means, you know, um, the person with Parkinson's is more of a fall risk. Uh, their loved one is still working. And so where are we doing caregivers? Do we need to reach to a local respite program? Do we need to look at assisted living facilities? And is that a possibility? Do we have the financial resources for that? And so in these transitions in care, we're often working working with people to kind of sort out some of those questions and help them figure out what makes most sense for them. Under goals of care, we're also, again, reviewing those advanced healthcare directives, talking through the types of medical decisions that may have to be made now or in the future, and completing what we call here in the state of California a POLST form, which stands for Physician Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. That's a different type of form than an advanced health care directive. The POLST form is just one sheet. And here in California, it's bright pink. It's something that we do upload it to the medical record, but it's something that um, families and patients keep in their home, usually on the fridge. And what it is, it's, it's an order that if an emergency were to happen and somebody chooses that they don't, if Someone chooses, I, if I die in my home, I do not want the paramedics to come and resuscitate me. So in that situation, if that is your choice, then it's an important, then a post form is an important document to have on the ready in case of an emergency in the home. Because otherwise, um, if that's your wish, but you don't have a post form, then when paramedics come into the home, they're gonna do everything above and beyond, likely intubate you, if you have died and they've resuscitated you. And so those are a lot of procedures that people decide they don't want done. And so it's important to have that documented in a post form. And so how do we help with all of these things? We help again, we support with communication. So we have these difficult conversations. You can imagine it's not easy to talk about, um, do you wanna be resuscitated? Uh, do you want a feeding tube? What does that look like for you? What does, a, what does the quality of life mean to you? What does quality of death mean to you? Those are difficult conversations, which is why we have an interdisciplinary team, which is why a social worker is in the room and why a spiritual care counselor is in the room, because we recognize that this isn't just a conversation about a medical decision, but goes much deeper than that. We want to provide families with education, again, so that with the intention of you making an informed decision about your personal care, we have no agenda in terms of what's right or what's wrong. We want to just provide the information, the education, and the resources so that you can make an informed decision. We talk in palliative care a lot about a roadmap for the future. Because there's so much uncertainty in Parkinson's disease, um, there are, you know, markers along the road, which again, I call crossroads of, you know, someone needing more care, you know, which direction can we go in? What can that look like? And we try to help families create that map. And the reason why this is important is, is a pillar of palliative care is that it's holistic. So we do want to assess all of these different areas, the physical, the emotional, the social, and the spiritual, but it takes a team to do that. 
And so when we talk about person-centered care, a lot of people ask me, you know, well, what does that mean? And it means that we're looking at the person with Parkinson's as more than their medical condition. That is the palliative care lens. This person is more than their Parkinson's disease. They have a family and friends. They have hopes and fears. They have their faith or their spiritual community. They have their, let's look at their emotional well being. Let's find out what they did for a living and how they identify and who is in their family. Because if we have all of those different pieces of who this person is, then we get a better picture of how to treat them. And so a lot of times the physician that I work with would say, I want, I'm gathering all this information because I want to make sure that the recommendations, the medical recommendations that I give you make sense to you and to what's important to you. And we provide that patient-centered care by asking person-centered questions, by being intentional about collecting a social history. And so most of us are used to the medical history, right? Um, your blood pressure and when were you diagnosed and who diagnosed you and what other specialists are you seeing and how many falls have you had in the last month? But in palliative care, we also want to know, where did you grow up? My favorite question, how did you meet your spouse? You know, tell me more about your family and support system. You know, tell me more about the career that you retired from. What was it about that? that brought you joy? And are there aspects of that that you can still experience now? Because all of those person-centered questions, again, help us with the goals of care conversation. You know, I just, I remember clearly one um, family that we saw where the person, I don't think he had Parkinson's, he had ALS because we see other neurological disorders. Um, which does very severely impact your ability to uh, eat and swallow. And so for him, chocolate was very important. And he made that very clear. The day I can't eat chocolate ice cream is the day that I want to talk about, you know, transitions in care, is the day that I'm going to be open to um, hospice care. When I can no longer do that, then I am ready to talk to my family about transitioning my care to a different model. And that was important for us to know, right? That this person finds great joy and pleasure in eating chocolate ice cream. And if he's unable to do that, and if you know all food is taken away, then there's another discussion that needs to happen. And under advanced care planning, that's a lot of what we do, thinking about decision-making capacity. If someone is starting to develop dementia, then let's talk about it now so that that person's um, wishes and their goals of care and their healthcare decisions can be documented now before the cognitive impairment turns into dementia. And that happens through the healthcare directive, the advanced healthcare planning that we talked a little bit about, and also by assessing people's personal values, really talking about how do we match this up, what's important to you with what's in your advanced care plan. It's also how we support people in transitions in care, really thinking about what are your perceptions? You know, there are some people who are very clear that I never want to move out of my home. So we're going to make it wheelchair accessible. We're going to make changes in the home to make sure that happens. There's some people who say, you know, I have the resources to pay for assisted living. And that's what I want to do. I don't want all the care to fall on my family. I want to be able to live in a facility and for them to come and visit me, but know that I'm well taken care of. And that's an important conversation to have. That's important for us to know. And again, when we communicate prognosis, it is person-centered. So we're looking at what the patient and the family preferences are. Maybe the provider, the referring provider, like the movement disorder specialist, referred somebody over for goals of care. But that's not really something the family wants to talk about. That's okay. We don't have to talk about it, right? Because we need to consider what is the patient's preference? What is the family's preference? What, are, what cognitive considerations have to um, take into account? What is this what is your level of understanding? Maybe you do understand um, where they are in their disease. And it was just about having a conversation about it. In some situations that we've been in, we have asked the patient and the care partner, 
do you want to talk more about prognosis? Are you a detailed person? Are you a big picture person? Some people say big picture. I don't want to know details. And maybe the person with Parkinson's does. So sometimes we'll separate people out and say, okay, spouse doesn't want to hear all the details. So how about you go to another room with Adriana and me, the physician, I'm going to stay with the person with Parkinson's and talk a little bit about this more. You know, our goal is not to cause distress. It's to assess each person's need and go from there. <clears throat> The care partners and the family members are really important parts of the palliative care model and palliative care clinics in that we are going to be assessing the caregivers. Caregivers are sometimes surprised. Why are you asking many questions at their medical appointment? And we say because your experience is important and because we want to provide you support as well. Because we know that care partners and caregivers are also experiencing their own symptoms, whether that be physical fatigue or sleep or pain of their own, mental health, whether that's something that they were experiencing before or now is exacerbated, symptoms of depression and anxiety due to the amount of care that their loved one needs. Their emotional well-being is always being challenged when we're providing care to somebody. No matter what stage of disease they may be in, giving care to someone takes a piece of us right? And so there are going to be emotions that come up with that. Feelings maybe of guilt, feelings of anger, feelings of, you know, we use this term in, in our field, ambiguous loss, which is feeling a sense of grief around the things that your loved one has lost, um, but also then feeling kind of guilty that you're feeling grief because your loved one is still here. So it's complex and it is confusing. And so a lot of times we want to validate that, acknowledge it, talk about it and offer support. And then I never want to discount the financial stress that families can come under when they are looking at the cost of care or even the loss of income. You know, I have had people, um, spouses who have had to stop working in order or have had to retire sooner than they anticipated in order to provide support to their loved one. And that financial stress can really keep you up at, at night. It can be really scary to confront the cost of care. And so we want to talk through that again, provide support, talk about it, give ideas of how to alleviate that, or just validate it, acknowledge that that's real. And again, we provide that support by family-centered questions. I love asking families, how would you describe the, your loved one? What would you want us to know about them that we wouldn't find in their medical record? And it's, it's really, it ends up being a joyful conversation about all the things that they love about them. How has this been for you? Again, some families are surprised that we pay so much time to them, but you, caregivers and family members are important. So we want to know, how has this been for you? What does your support look like? Are there other family members or support people who should be invited to our visits? and providing education, not just us giving education, but recognizing that care partners and families have a piece of the puzzle in terms of their loved one's symptoms. So we want to know from, from you all also, what have you noticed about their progression? That's important information for us. And so there's usually a lot of questions about palliative care because people, it's new. Um, and it's newly brought up to them. So they want to know, you know, how do I access palliative care? And so when I give talks like this, I say, talk to your neurologist, talk to your movement disorder specialist, or even your primary care provider, if you have a, a closer relationship or it's easier to communicate with them about access to palliative care within your health system. And so at UCSD, that means if somebody is seeing one of the movement disorder specialists that I work with, and maybe they're hearing this talk and they had never been referred to palliative care, then they would ask their doctor, hey, you know, I went to this talk about palliative care. Do we have a palliative care clinic here in our, at UCSD? And then that provider would say, actually, we do. I can put in a referral. Is that something you're interested in? Um, if, you, if your provider doesn't know, then you can ask um, Google. <laughs> what I came up with. You can look up, you know, palliative care clinics or home palliative care in your area. Um, but most of the time, your primary care, your neurologist, or your movement disorder specialist is going to know if they have a palliative care clinic. 
um, for you. A lot of people ask me, especially when I do these community talks, when should I be asking for a referral to palliative care? And that really dep depends. It is appropriate at any stage of your disease progression to meet with a palliative care team for consult. So just because you meet with that team one time doesn't mean you have to keep following up. Most people do, especially if they're in the middle or advanced stages of the disease, they tend to want to meet every three months. But some people say, okay, now I understand what the team is. It's not something I quite need right now, but like maybe let's meet or check in again in six months or a year, or let's not put an appointment on the books, but I have the contact information. I'll be in touch. I think it's always good practice to be curious about what you have access to and to maybe go to an initial consult because again, that goes along with making informed decisions. And so most of the time when people are newly diagnosed, I say, oh, it's not a priority to see palliative care when you're first diagnosed, unless you're experiencing a lot of dis distress and feeling like you don't have a strong support system to kind of help you work through that then that makes sense. But if somebody has good support and they're still working and the medications are working well to manage their symptoms and they have a therapist that they're working with, then maybe it's not as much as a priority and, and people can, can decide to ask for a referral more when their symptoms are, are impacting their quality of life or impacting their abilities to do their day-to-day -day tasks. And then I get a, a question, or I alluded to this when we talked about accessing palliative care. What if I don't have access to palliative care through my health system? And that's when I you know, say, Google, see if you have home health palliative care, which is also called community-based in your area. You can call and find out if they take your insurance because palliative care is a billed service. And most Medicare insurances nationally will pay for palliative care but it's just a matter of having one local to you. Uh, and then community-based palliative cares, the insurance might be trickier, but it's always okay to call and find out. If you really don't have access to palliative care, whether through your health system or through a home base, you know, bring your own team together. Really take a step back and think about who, who are the people that I'm interacting with the most and what do I want them to know? It's okay to take the reins of your medical care. It's okay to send a message to your movement disorder specialist before your appointment through your electronic health record saying, I want to review my advanced care directive. I filled it out 15 years ago and I want to talk to you about it. It is okay to, to prioritize some of these questions if you have them. If you don't have an advanced health care directive and you're not ready to ask your movement disorder specialist to go over it with you, there is a really good website called prepareforyourcare.org. I give it to everybody who I work with that doesn't have an advanced health care directive and I tell them, look at it, print it out. The, what I like about this advanced health care directive is it has prompts and questions for you. And so look through it and then once you feel like you have an understanding of what some of the decisions you might have to make, then talk to your provider about it and say, I'm going through my advanced health care directive, but I have a question about this. So I have a question about this medical intervention and how it could impact me uh, because it's about in making informed decisions. And utilize your local and national PD support organizations like PCLA to get information, to get education, uh, Davis Finney, Finney Foundation, the Parkinson's Foundation, they have helplines to help people kind of talk through some of these questions or where they can refer you to maybe workshops or other webinars that can address some of the questions that you have. And I really like the points that are really important to remember are, are that palliative care is not the same as hospice. And so by signing up for palliative care, that doesn't mean that you're no longer seeing your primary care and that you're no longer seeing your movement disorder specialist and that you're not treating your high blood pressure. It's a supportive care team. It's what we call an additional layer of support for a person and their family. We provide an extra layer of support utilizing this palliative model, utilizing a holistic approach. Even if your loved one has some cognitive impairment, it is important for people with Parkinson's to discuss and document their medical care preferences. 
and the neuropalliative care team that is well suited to meet the changing needs of people with Parkinson's and their support system. I think I'm good on time so that we have some, if we have questions, we can go through them. Uh, we have some wonderful questions and comments in the chat. We have one about if you know if Medicare covers palliative care, and I think you did address that, that for most people. Yeah, I've never had, in the case of UCSD and our palliative care patients, I've never heard that it wasn't covered through someone's Medicare insurance. Mm -hmm. That's my yeah. understanding. Because it's a specialty. It's not something outside or it's not, you know, elective. It's a medical specialty. So it's like any other, if you have access to a movement disorder specialist through your Medicare, you should have access to a palliative care specialist through your Medicare insurance. Mm -hmm. There's also a question if, um, do you know if there are usually unusually long waiting times before a first appointment for palliative care? That really depends on the clinic. And so in my experience at our clinic, no, we can usually get somebody in within six weeks, um, but that might not be the case in other clinics with other providers. What I'd like to do now is for those people that possibly cannot, uh, type if you would like to unmute yourself say your name and ask your question Legra. hi everyone um thanks so much adriana this is really helpful i'm actually here kind of um on behalf of my parents my mom has parkinson's and my dad is her primary caregiver and um i'm just i just want to be really clear so the first step like if the if tr if if i'm if i want to help and advise them get involved with the palliative clinic would you suggest reaching out to their neurologist to find out which clinic that he's affiliated with? Um, I'm just trying to figure out what would be the very next action step to um, help um, help support them in kind of, is it making an appointment? I mm -hmm. guess before that, it's actually finding which clinic would be the right fit. So I'd welcome exactly. Any yeah. So if, you know, in San Diego, there's a lot of different uh, movement disorder specialists and neurologists who treat Parkinson's who aren't necessarily a UCSD provider. Right. And we are a UCSD palliative care clinic. And so what I tell my community members is start with your neurologist or your movement disorder specialist and ask them, where do they refer for subspecialty? So if it's a neurologist, where do you refer? If you were going to refer me to a movement disorder specialist, where would it be? It might be that the closest palliative care clinic is at a, at a, a academic uh, medical center. And those usually, because your healthcare system doesn't have a palliative care specialist, then the insurance would cover it if you were to go to UCSD or one of the other big healthcare systems. So it does start with, you know, who are we affiliated with when it comes to specialty or subspecialty? Thank you. Thank you. We, we do have one other question in here. I'm from Gil Anderson. Currently, there has been major issues with our provider, Stanford's clinic, not having availability of movement disorder specialists. In fact, the panel is closed. Sadly, trying to get traction through clinical trials has been difficult too. What do you recommend? So I want to acknowledge that our health, which you already guys, you guys already know, our healthcare system is broken. Um, and when our patients, when people are waiting for an appointment with their movement disorder specialist for eight months, and that's the case at UCSD, it's horrendous. You know, it's, it's not right. Um, and so I want to recognize that that is a national issue for people having access to a movement disorder specialist, which is so, right. why it's so important to have a good understanding of your disease so that you can be able to Is there another clinic that I can go to? In terms of the clinical trials, if you're able to get into a clinical trial at Stanford Times, reaching out, the Michael J. Fox Foundation has a listing of all clinical trials nationally, reach to other locations to see who else has clinical trials. I think a, the a, issue of access is systemic and not something that there's to on, in terms of how to fix because it's something that is, you know, a plague in our communities. Thank you. That was a great answer. I think this is the issue is this long-term 
uh, wait to see movement disorder specialists, and I have heard that it is national now. So whatever we can do to help facilitate that and make life easier for people with PD, I think that's what our ultimate goal is. Um, again, I can't thank you enough. This has been really great. And I just want to share with everyone, we have some wonderful upcoming events in May. We'll hear about, and um, we are looking at May's Mental Health Month, and that we'll be dealing with concerns in Parkinson's and how to boost our mood for maximum quality of life. We'll also present the latest advances in deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's, as we'll be joined by a neuropsychologist who will talk about living alone with Parkinson's. Links to register for these events as well as updates for all of our programs will be sent to you via our email list. Today I'd like to thank all of our wonderful sponsors, Abbott, Boston Scientific, Kio Curran, and Supernus. And of course, by you. By donating to PCLA, you can join us in our mission to improve the lives of the families to our community who are living with Parkinson's. PCLA is a nonprofit and all donations are tax deductible. If you enjoyed today's program, please consider donating at PCLA.org to help us continue to provide programs like this for free. We have just a few days left on our Parkinson's Awareness Month fundraiser. Considering, consider, please consider donating just $3 to help us reach our goal of raising $3,000 in 30 days for our programs for the community. We only have $276 to go to get to our goal. So hopefully some of you will help us make that happen today. As always, reach out to us with questions at info at PCLA or by phone at 310-880-880. 3143. Thank you, Adriana. It was amazing. And thank you all for joining us today.